Let me ask the first question, yes. Professor. Uh, you know, when uh, you first sent the title of your talk, yes. Bodhi Dharma, Teaching Without Words, uh, it was uh, very fascinating and made us think about teaching without words. Now, from your talk it emerges that uh, teaching without words was a practical necessity. At the same time, there are, uh, there are uh, accounts in Indian history of uh, persons with saintly character who spoke very little and they influenced others not with words but just the power of their personality. Yes, yes. Now, could you shed some light on this other aspect of teaching or influencing without words? And did it have any resonance in India-China interaction? Well, the teaching without words, as I say, there's, there's a, it starts with a practical situation. But why did this practical situation catch on? You know, why was it became it so popular? Well, I suggested because education in China and also to a large extent in India is you educate by example. You know, in uh, in in where I come from, from Europe, uh, you can say something and and give facts, but your personal life can be a mess. But if if your personal life is a mess in in Asia, that's no good for a teacher. You know, it's, it's not appreciated here. So this is a this, this split knowledge and behavior is a quite European, basically. I'm not. I never say Western. You know, I, I hate East and West. Those words. Because where is it? Something is always east of east and west of west. You know, it's uh, east. East is just east of west, <laughs> and west is west of east. And there is always east and west. It all depends. You know, when I'm in the far west and I keep going west, I end up in the far east. You know, it's uh, so. It's uh, it's uh, this east west thing. One should really define what you mean by west. And when when you define west, the European cultural area. Okay, then we can talk. Then we have something to talk about. But uh, it's not just East. It's New Zealand. Is that West? You know, it's uh, it's East from India. <laughs> yes. So it's things like that. So East and West are relative. Of course, if I would talk about East and West, I'm sure the building would not be big enough. You know, it's very popular. That's what people want to hear. And then I usually say, yeah, where is it? Uh, and, and, and then I'll probably half of the people will leave the room, I suppose. This is a, because East and West, I don't use that. European cultural area, which includes US, I believe that. Not only because I'm European, but it's just the truth. It's a Latin and Greek heritage, just like the Sanskrit heritage here. It's a cultural area, which you define. So in here, the education is by example, largely. Teachers teach by example. So that's why Bodhidharma, meditating, maybe sometimes saying something, a word which sounded familiar to Chinese people, uh, and then the Chinese as associated with things they knew, and uh, that's how it Bodhidharma taught, I suppose. But he did not explain because he just could not. And uh, he never learned Chinese. That's another thing. He, he could have learned it after 10 years. Uh, he, he might have been fluent, who knows, being there, but he didn't. He just meditated. Uh, so this teaching without words, it's a typical Asian possibility. If I read the Lankavatara Sutra, how he explains it, he says, uh, when 
teaching without words is unabilapa is the, the, the using of the words, that's words. So it's unabilapena, without words. That's how it's translated, without words. Uh, he explains this just as ants, ants, kermi, do. You know, they're just ants, and in the animal world, they don't talk and teach, just, uh, but they transmit without words in the animal world. And that is how he explains this teaching without words, like just like in the animal world of kermi, which is translated as ants in Chinese. The Sanskrit could be more than just an ant, but it's a uh, kermi. That's how it's explained in the text itself, by behavior, just like animals do. Yes, you were first. Yes. <laughs> uh, Professor Charles Willeman, uh, thank you very, very much for your wonderful talk. And I just think it's a godsend that you have come from Bangkok to enlighten us and also throw more light on our own Indian culture and history. And talking about Bodhi Dharma and teaching without words, there's one thing which comes to mind. Talk is cheap. Yes. We have too much of talking. Yes. Also in India, other parts of the world, yes. too much of talk and very yes. little of good doing. Yes. yes. Saint Francis of Assisi, a yes. very famous yes. guy, yes. Yes. he says, preach but only use words if absolutely necessary. <laughs> yes. So you showed by example, yes, the, yes. the father of our country, the great Mahatma Gandhi, yes, yes. also said, my life is my message. Yes, Simple, yes, yes. lovely, loving life, yes, yes, which sure, we yes, should get yes, through. Yes. I have the greatest respect for Gautama Buddha because he was no ordinary man. But I am also seeking to know more about Gautama Buddha. And the thing is that I want to know where I could get the purest form of his teachings which have not been influenced by any Brahminical method. We are Brahmins by descent. I just want the purest form, if possible, of Gautama Buddha's teachings, what he gave there and which exists now. As simple as that. Well, you know, he comes from Kapilavastu. That's where he was born which is actually outside the 16 Janapadas, mm. yes? So, he was marginal to, this, to Indian culture, but he was living up the mountains, Nepal, and when you go to the cultural area, when you leave the house, leave the palace, you go down to Magadha in his days. So, he was by education, a little bit outside of the system. That's one thing. Then, uh, what he found is not linked with any varna. Anybody can... What he wanted, what he found was a way for perfect rest. Nirvana is called perfect rest. When all those Indians arrived in East Asia, in China, they had to explain it all. And as you know, if you use the word nirvana, Chinese would say, ah, what kind of an animal is that? If you would say karma, <laughs> but they would say it in Chinese probably, <laughs> this, uh, they didn't know. So the Indians had to explain everything. And those explanations, we find them in the Chinese translations. So the way those Indians explained Buddhism in China, even today helps us understand what karma is, intentional action, what nirvana is, namely perfect rest, no joy, no suffering, those, those things. Uh, he just found a way to get there. And I'm sure the Buddha was, did, he did not favor Sanskrit or any language. Anybody can do it. Actually, I could do it in Dutch. That's my mother language. So I, that's, he wouldn't oppose, he wouldn't object to that. Uh, but, and he wouldn't object to Sanskrit. So it's, uh, 
Ashvagosha wrote Sanskrit, and he was so uh, no problem there. Nagarjuna wrote Sanskrit. The people in Kashmir wrote Sanskrit, no problem there. And from 400 AD, everybody was writing Sanskrit from the Gupta times on. So this, uh, his message was just, here is what I found. This is a way to perfect rest. This is what I found, and you're free to use it. If you don't, if you think you can reach there with any other way, try it. He was never forcing anything on anybody. Uh, but he was a little bit outside of the Brahmanical system. Uh, but quite ironically, the most of his ten main disciples, he had ten great disciples, the f they were mostly Brahmins. Shariputra was one. Maudgalyayana was one. When I was in Nalanda, I used to, and Shariputra was f from around there, and I asked the people, you, do you know where Shariputra came from? And then the villagers would say, oh yes, he comes from there, you know. And then uh, when I asked, how about his friend, Maudgalyayana? He said, oh, he comes from there. <laughs> they still remember all those things. They were Brahmins still, and the tradition is still there now. Uh, so even though he was outside of that system, he still, his main converts were still Brahmins, including Gunabhadra, by the way. So, uh, and his last conversion was Subhadra on his deathbed, if I can call it that, between the Shala trees. Uh, he was sick and, uh, and there was a Brahmin who wanted to hear what the Buddha had to say. He was famous and then Ananda said, no, no, master is sick, you know, and, but the Buddha knew, he said, let him in. I will convert him. He said that on his deathbed. That was certainly a proof of uh, self-esteem. Subhadra. Su Su Subhadra. Su Subhadra. That was the last conversion on this, uh, between the Shala trees. And uh, when he was dying, if you want to know what the Buddha died of, there is an article in the Journal of the Pali Text Society. There is a, a German monk, a doctor, who uh, diagnosed the illness of the Buddha on his deathbed. It's not eating pork or it's not a mushroom. Uh, uh, it is simply some, well, mesenteric infarction. <laughs> it is, if it's, there, is a, there is an article about this in the Journal of the Politech Society, what he died of. It's really an, a medical analysis, a, 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 a diagnosis. Mesenteric infarction. I've written about that, I, you know, a long time ago, not long time ago, 2011, I think it was. To me, it's already a long time ago. This, uh, uh, we wrote in the same journal, Pacific World, about mat selected materials for the study of the life of Buddha Shakyamuni. So selected materials for the life of Buddha Shakyamuni. And it, for that article in Pacific World, I read all kinds of things about the life of the Buddha, also the cause of his death, you know, his, his bio data, you know, and what caused his death. And there I found this journal in the Polytech Society by this uh, monk, German monk, Metanando. And he, he writes, there, you find there the exact term, the diagnosis in that article. It's mesenteric infarction. I, actually, basically, he died of old age. That's the translation in normal terms. He got problem digesting. And that's what happens when you pass, when you're 80 years old. Actually, was he 80 years old? We don't know, you know. There's no birth certificate of the or anything like that. And the 80 years, all wise people live to be 80. Vasubandhu did, Buddha did. Never, nobody ever lived one Ayus. Ayus is 100 years. So there is, I don't know anybody who lived his complete Ayus, not even the Buddha. Almost, 
and people now people past the age of 100 yes mostly women <laughs> just, they, they, but they live, they live longer and longer and longer and longer than their ayus actually um, they prolong their ayus on skaras i suppose but i should leave any more remarks or or doctor Willem, yes. could I just share just one minute with you? Of course. And also, if you could just put some more light on this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Fifteen years ago, yes. when I was going through some documents of the Japanese Buddhist Association, yes. I came across certain references from the Diamond Sutra. Yes. And I spoke to the resident Japanese monk here. who is here for the last yes. 40 years. Yes. Yes. And he agreed with me 100%. Yes. I spoke to some other so-called authorities on this some didn't agree, some did. So, with your vast knowledge, because I don't want to lose this opportunity, if you can just spare a minute, and uh, then we will be in touch later in the future. Uh, this is from the Buddha from the Diamond Sutra, as per the Japanese Buddhist uh, Association. Five, he, Buddha says, this is about three weeks before you could die, 500 years after I'm, I, uh, sorry, 500 years after my death, there will arise another teacher of religion, Maitreya, who will produce faith by the fulfillment of this prophecy. You should know that he will plant the root of his teachings not in one, two, three, four, or five Buddhas, or in 10,000 Buddhas, but plant it at the root of all the Buddhas. When that one comes according to the prophecy, then have faith in him at once, and you will obtain incalculable blessings. In those days, brethren, there will rise in the world an exalted one named Maitreya. He will be an Arhant, fully awakened, abounding in wisdom and goodness, happy with knowledge of the words, unsurpassed as a guide to mortals willing to be led, a teacher for gods and men, an exalted one, a Buddha, even as I am now. He, by himself, will thoroughly know and see, as it were, face to face this universe with its words of the spirits, its Brahmas and its Maras, and its world of recluse and Brahmins, of princes and peoples, even as I know by myself, thoroughly now and see them. The law, lovely in its original, lovely in its progress, lovely in its consummation, he will proclaim both in the spirit and the letter. The higher life he will make known in all its fullness and all its purity, even as I do now. He will be accompanied by a congregation of some thousands of brethren, even as I am now accompanied by a congregation of hundreds of brethren. Diga Nikya 3.16 Chattavati Sihananda Sutan. The eightfold part of Buddha, where he says right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. This whole prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus Christ, who says in the chapter of John eight times, I am all these things. Actually, Maitreya is the Buddha of the future, you know, is the, the, the Buddhist Messiah, let's say. So after the Buddha died, the world deteriorated, you know, uh, it goes from bad to worse. And when people will have forgotten all about the Buddha Dharma, a new Buddha will arise, and that will be Maitreya. So Maitreya is now waiting in the Tushita heaven, sitting like this, uh, uh, waiting <laughs> until he comes down on earth. So he's the only bodhisattva uh, in, in Sarvastivada Buddhism, in, Thera, in Staviravada Buddhism. Uh, so this, uh, he's, uh, he's just uh, the Buddha of the future. Actually, I think he started to be, he started as a, a normal person. You know, uh, there, was a, there was this southern teacher called Bhavati. And Bhavati heard about this new teacher up north called uh, Gautama Siddhartha who had interesting things to say and he went to meet him. And uh, he listened to what uh, he heard and he converted. 
And if the master converts, all the disciples have to convert too. You know, uh, no, no choice. And one of those disciples was Maitreya. And he was apparently, I'm sure, the brightest one of them all. So he would be the next Buddha, yes? So it's, I always understand developments starting from a very practical down-to-earth situation. And later come the profound explanations, uh, very devout things. Of course, I'm not denying those, but that's not how it began. It, it begins with a practical situations. Even new Tathagatas and new Bodhisattvas, even the Buddha himself, yes, he walked the earth in, in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. You know, he, 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 he was a person of flesh and blood. He, was, uh, he had 32 characteristics, not like everybody else, but he, he was still a person. So all the other Bodhisattvas and the Tathagatas, maybe they started like that too, you know, and they became deified, sanctified, uh, as you may call it. So Maitreya is the one of the future, and every Buddhist, whether Mahasangika or Saviravada, they believe he will be the future, but we're still waiting for him. And by the way, it's very dangerous to have uh, someone like that, because in history, it has very often happened that there was someone saying, I, I'm Maitreya, now you all follow me, you know, this is a... So there have been some people standing up, leading revolutions, pretending to be Maitreya. So this is a entire idea has been misused in history very often. It's a dangerous one. Uh, but anyway, Maitreya is the one of the future. And the Vajracharika believes that. But the Vajracharika is not the Lankavatara Sutra. You have two basic texts for Chan, for Zen. And the oldest one is Gunabhadra's Lankavatara. And so the old school is called the Lanka school. Until around 730, there is a monk uh, who revolts against the then leader of Chan. The monk's name was Shen Hui, and he revolted against Shen Xiu. Uh, and this monk, Shen Xiu, uh, was the Lanka school representative with the Sarvastivada ideas, as I said. Uh, Shamatha Vipassana kind of meditation. But then this revolting monk, Shen, Shen Hui, he stressed the, the, the Vajracharika, the diamond cutter, you know. He, so the, the stress shifted from Lankavtara to Vajracharika. And that happened in 730. And ever since that day, ever since then, Chen, Chan or Zen, uh, is known as a school which bases his, itself on the on this Vajracharika. You know, again, you see that opposition, Mahasangika, that's Pratyaparamita, that's Vajracharika, and you see the old Lanka school, which is basically Savastivada idea. So it shifts from one again to the other. It's a uh, and that's what happened to in the development of Zen. It's a uh, one question, which may sound uh, somewhat uh, outside the ambit of this talk, but since some of the the timelines and the period that you mentioned. Uh, 8th century, uh, I want to know how the birth of Islam influenced the, the conversations in uh, Buddhism between India and uh, China. And as you rightly said, India was cultural India, straddling right from Afghanistan to uh, eastwards. And 
Islam was already spreading to Central Asia. So could you shed some light on uh, so, the yes. Buddhism-Islam well, interaction? It, Islam begins um, in the 7th century. Yeah. Before that, there was no Islam. So it begins in the 7th century, which is quite late. So at that time, the Buddha who died in 482 or 83 BC, uh, that's, a, that's a long, long time after the Buddha. Seven and the 730, yes, that's, uh, there is no mention of any Islam in any sutra or anything, only in the Kala Chakra Tantra. In the Kala Chakra Tantra, that's the, the last phase, let's say around 1200 AD, something like that. The Kala Chakra Tantra uh, in Mantrayana Buddhism at the end, then the Muslims are coming. It's mentioned there. But uh, so their, their coming is mentioned in the Kala Chakra, which does not exist in China. This uh, last phase, uh, Samvarodaya Tantra, Kala Chakra Tantra, the last phase of Mantrayana is not in China. It is, it is not among the Han Chinese. It's, uh, but it was in India. And around 1200, uh, it mentions the the Muslims, but it doesn't give any value judgment there. It's uh, you know people have been talking about why why Buddhism deteriorated and why it uh, almost died out, uh, and blaming the Muslims destroying everything for that, which is not true. It is uh, actually. Buddhism was, was being assimilated with the main Hindu tradition. So you have a Shiva Avalokiteshvara kind of idea. You have identifications. You see objects in the museum here in India. So the, and they were using the same Sanskrit language. Uh, so this, uh, the association became quite close. And the Buddhists even used Shaivite techniques in their uh, Abhisheka, in their initiation in Mantrayana. Never, never Buddhist, never Islam ideas. So, but this, uh, this association, what I'm saying is that when the Muslims came, uh, Buddhism was already not so strong anymore. It was losing to the main tradition which is the Hindu tradition. It was assimilated, more or less. So when the, Mus the Muslims came, they just gave the last push uh, to uh, a Buddhism, which in India itself was already almost assimilated with the Hindu tradition. It, it becomes very clear when you see Hindu, uh, Indian traditions which do not use Sanskrit. I'm talking about the Jains. The Jains never, never assimilated, never started using Sanskrit. They never assimilated, and they kept their identity through the ages until today in their Jain Prakrit language. Another thing is, if you look at Sri Lanka and Pali, they never started using Sanskrit there. Pali won. So that's why. Buddhism stayed there. It never associated with the main Hindu tradition. So I gave you two examples of uh, philosophical religious streams which never associated with the main Hindu tradition, which Buddhism on the continent usually did. You know, they even use Hindu techniques in their in their yoga, in the Mantrayana yoga. So uh, they did not need Muslims to come and destroy everything. They actually gave the last push, that's all. Uh, and they're just mentioned, and only mentioned as far as I know, in the Kala Chakra Tantra, around 1200.
No, you mean? Prakrit so, language was prevailing that time. Prakrit is really very important. As a European, I studied Latin and Greek and Sanskrit, you know? That was the normal thing to do, actually. Uh, I didn't have to study the syntax anymore. And even the morphology was quite similar. So it's quite normal. But later, I realized that to study early Buddhism especially, Prakrit would have been more useful. Uh, the Buddhist language in India from 400 AD on is Sanskrit. Before that, it was Prakrit. And many Prakrits. In the Northwest, the Gandhari Prakrit, yes. But uh, in other places, they used the local Prakrit or some mixed Prakrit because the Buddhists were traveling. And as they traveled across the continent, subcontinent, people joined, people left, and the, the, their Prakrit became a mix of different Prakrits. That's what Pali ultimately is, but also the pra Prakrit of Mahishasaka and things like that. So Prakrit is the main Buddhist language before 400 AD. And, uh, so when you study the old Buddhist text before 400 AD, it's Prakrit. You, even Chinese texts were translated from Prakrit, mainly, not exclusively, but mainly from Gandhari Prakrit. And it's only with Kumara Jiva that it becomes Sanskrit. That's why with Kumara Jiva, the Chinese terminology changes because the underlying Indian language changes. So also the translated languages, the translation also changes. So Prakrit is the basic language before 400 AD. L later there will be a partial comeback in Mantrayana when Apabrausha shows up again, you know, in Bay of Bengal and when this kind, uh, but not before the seventh century and, and only, oh, only sporadically, not, not mainstream. Uh, this is the language development of the Buddhist texts.